You're listening to India Bio Speaks, your one-stop resource for science, news, and careers. Hello, everybody. With the recent outbreak and rapid spread of the novel coronavirus, we at India Bio Speaks wanted to understand how to model the progression of the disease and make predictions. It is a numbers game, after all. Today, we are chatting with Dr. Satabra Sinha, a professor in the physics group at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, who works on mathematical epidemiology. Thank you, Dr. Sinha, for joining us today in this chat. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to begin by talking to you about the current COVID-19 outbreak that we are witnessing. From a mathematical standpoint, what is your understanding of the situation? The current situation we are seeing is definitely a very alarming one. As of today, COVID-19 has um, infected just about 4 lakh individuals all around the world. And in India alone, we have more than 500 cases. Now, this is surprising when you consider the fact that the first infected case was identified in China on December 31st. So effectively, we are talking about 4 lakh infections in space of less than three months. Now, that may appear surprising. How is it possible to have so many people getting infected in so short a time? However, from the point of view of a mathematical understanding of epidemics, it's not so hard to understand. Essentially, what we are witnessing is exponential growth through a process of geometric progression. Let us assume that one infected person can infect two people. So initially, you just have one infected person, and then maybe later you have two more. But then those two would go on to infect four, those four would go on to infect eight, those eight would go on to infect 16, and very quickly you'll have the number of cases going into thousands, tens of thousands, and so on. This process of doubling need not be confined to just you know, one single multiplicative factor of two. You take any multiplicative factor, if it is greater than one, so if one infected person can infect on average more than one other individual, essentially you'd have an exponential growth in the number of infections. And that's precisely what we are witnessing today. Dr. Sinha, you just alluded to the fact that you can build a mathematical model for a disease. Can you tell our audience a bit more about this? Sure. The mathematical understanding of epidemics, which was originated by Sir Ronald Ross, who's famous for his work on malaria, is just about a century old. And the present mathematical models of epidemic spreading trace their lineage from the work of Kermak and McKendrick in the 1920s. So they developed what are called compartmental models of epidemic spreading. So in compartmental models, we divide the entire population into several groups. In the simplest of the compartmental models, there are just three groups corresponding to the population of susceptible individuals, the population of infected individuals, and the population of individuals who have either recovered from the disease or have been removed through death. The equations that Kermak and McKendrick wrote tell us how people from the susceptible pool move on to the pool of infected people, and then how individuals from the infected pool move on to the pool of recovered or removed individuals. So the solution of these equations tell us how the number of individuals in each of these populations change over time. 
So effectively, the solutions depend on two very important parameters, one of them being the ease with which the pathogen can transmit from an infected individual to a susceptible individual whom the infected person comes in contact with. And the other is the rate at which infected individuals either recover or get removed through death. So once you have these numbers, you can solve the equations and you can plot how the number of infected individuals would change over time. So initially during an epidemic, you will see this number zoom up in an exponential growth until it reaches a saturation point. And then it starts curving downward. And after long times, it will either completely die out or becomes endemic in the population. Now the reason you have the curve eventually curving downwards is after some time, the disease runs out of fresh susceptible individuals to infect. Even if you do have susceptible individuals in the population, they have become so rare that the pathogen finds it very hard to seek them out in a population which is now mostly consisting of people who have earlier contracted the disease and have recovered and are therefore now immune to the disease. And this essentially gives us this very characteristic curve of an epidemic having an exponential growth followed by a decline to either complete absence of the disease or in the disease in some endemic state. Thank you for shedding some light on how to build mathematical models of diseases and the kind of parameters that go into this modeling. I believe the basic reproduction number is one of the most important among these parameters. Can you expand upon this? The basic reproduction number for an epidemic is the single most important mathematical quantity characterizing it. In simple terms, it is the average number of people that a single infected person passes on the infection to. So going back to the example I was giving earlier, if an infected person passes on the infection to two other individuals, and then those people infect four and those infect eight, then we are looking at a basic reproduction number of two. However, this number could be anything. It could be 1.5, it could be four. And so knowing the number would give us an idea of how quickly the number of infected cases is going to increase over time. The bigger the reproduction number, the quicker the number of infected cases would grow over time. Using Kermak and McKendrick's theory, we can actually relate this basic reproduction number to the parameters of the compartmental model. It looks like it's very important to be able to calculate the basic reproduction number for a disease as it gives you an estimate as to how many cases are going to be seen in the upcoming days. Based on the data that we have so far, has the basic reproduction number for the COVID-19 been calculated for India specifically? And what kind of estimations or models are you and your colleagues running right now using this parameter? So the basic reproduction number for COVID-19 has been estimated for most of the places where the outbreak has been observed. And it appears to be varying between 3.8, uh, this is the number we see for Denmark, and at the lower end, we see numbers like 1.5, for example, for Japan. The compartmental model predicts that in the initial phase of the epidemic, the number of infected people would grow exponentially with a rate that is a function of the basic reproduction number. So if we can actually plot this data in a graph paper and see this exponential curve, 
And we fit this using an exponential function and estimate the rate of growth. Then inverting this function, we can actually tell you what the basic reproduction number should be. So this is what we have been doing with the Indian data, starting from the number of cases we saw on March 4th, which is the day when the number of infections went from single digits to 23. So from this day onwards, we are plotting this number of cases as a function of days, and we see clearly an exponentially increasing curve. So when we fit this curve with a function, we find that this corresponds to a basic reproduction number of about 1.8. So using this now, we can project forward and make some predictions as to how many cases would we expect to see in the next couple of days with some error estimates as to the lower and upper bound of these predictions. But of course, these models need to be calibrated every so often with the actual numbers because as the measures which are put in place by the government kicks in, the nature of the spreading of the disease may change. And so you can't project these numbers too far into the future, but rather only use them to make short-term predictions. Thank you very much for chatting with us today, Dr. Sita Brunsana, and telling us about how you build mathematical models to study disease spread. I'm sure that our audience will find this conversation very interesting and insightful. At this point, we're going to take a break in the conversation, but do join us in the next podcast where we continue this discussion with Dr. Sita Brasinha. Specifically, we talk about more sophisticated mathematical models and how they have been used to model previous outbreaks. Thank you all for listening. Do take care, stay safe, and watch out for more updates from India Biospeaks. If you're passionate about scientific research, communication, outreach, and science education as we are, please connect and engage with us, and here are some ways that you can do so. Visit our website at www.indiabioscience.org. Subscribe to our newsletters. Write for us and join our online discussion forum at discuss.indiabioscience.org. Advertise jobs, grants and events in the life sciences on our website. And feel free to contact us anytime at hello at indiabioscience.org. Until next time, enjoy your science and stay engaged to enable change.